Yeah, so hi guys. Um, thanks for sticking around until the last talk of the day. Um, I know everybody's probably pretty tired. Um, this is a little bit less, uh, less high tech than Olivier, uh, so hopefully, uh, hopefully easy to follow along with. And if we go through it a little bit quicker than half an hour, uh, don't hold me too accountable. Um, this is a subject that I've been thinking about quite a bit since some work I did with, with the Army uh, about two years ago, uh, taking a look at domain names uh, in the public infrastructure. I've been quite curious about what's possible uh, with a low, sort of a low-hanging fruit style of attack. Um, probably a lot of you, especially if you're more technical, familiar with the internet and the way it works, DNS is not a mystery, full of vulnerabilities. Um, in the Army, we talk about something called an asymmetrical attack. So the cost of putting a roadside bomb, for example, uh, is a fraction of the cost of defending against that attack. Uh, I think this is a similar, a similar thing in cyberspace that's worth considering. Uh, it's something that's been around for a long time, and we'll dig into that a little bit. Um, yeah, so introduction. Uh, currently SOC analyst at Commissioners de Quebec. Uh, big thanks to JP and the rest of the team for encouraging me to to, to come up here today and give my first talk at a security conference. Um, thank you. <laughs> it's, a, it's a hell of a place to do it, too, so it's exciting. Uh, also, cyber protection team lead uh, with 34 Signal Regiment in Westmount. We're a reserve unit in the Army. Uh, previously, spent many years working as a home automation integrator, a uh, smart home guy, a lot of custom AV, uh, home theaters. Uh, lighting control, HVAC, that, that kind of thing. Um, also, software product manager for a mobile app, uh, where I spent a lot of time dealing specifically with user behavior and user issues. Um, so there's a lot of overlap there, too. I think this talk is a bit of a culmination of a lot of my, my experience. Um, so what's on the agenda? I want to talk quickly about human fallacy and the role it plays in some attacks. I want to talk about DNS specifically, some of the challenges with that, and email security challenges. Uh, we're going to take a closer look at cyber squatting and maybe refresher for some of you, maybe some new angles to think about. Um, and then I want to bring you sort of on the inside of a little evil experiment that I conducted uh, over the last uh, 45 days. Um, and then obviously we'll talk about protecting ourselves and our organizations and then some closing thoughts. Uh, maybe we can talk about more in the panel. So it's a cartoon that resonates with me pretty well. On one side we've got data security and uh, firewalls and everything that goes along with that. On the other side, we have Dave, who's the walking uh, epitome of human error. Because um, the point is that you can put a lot of technical controls in place, but it's really hard to account for some of the human factors involved. Now, we see that firsthand. A uh, recent report, probably all saw this in the news, uh, was released by Bellingcat. A bunch of US soldiers were using flashcards to study overseas and uh, we're leaking top nuclear secrets. <laughs> uh, some of the most top secret information in the United States uh, was revealed, 100% human error, uh, OPSEC issue there. More recently, city of Ottawa, we saw humans involved in a scam, a social engineering experiment where somebody was pretending to be a, a partner on behalf of the Salvation Army requesting the city of Ottawa change the bank account that they transfer money to and made away with $558,000 in city funds. 100% uh, human driven. Probably my favorite example, if anybody should be secure, it's the President of the United States, uh, OPSEC fail, even surrounded by the best people in the world in cybersecurity, arguably, uh, still using a password like Mega2020 was the first example, if I remember correctly. Second one was You're Fired. Happened twice, his account was guessed by security researchers from, uh, from uh, I think it was Denmark. So why does all of this matter? Um, you know, according to Agres report, 94% of organizations have experienced a data breach um, in the last year, with human error being the leading cause of serious incidents. Uh, on the other hand, only 21% of technology leaders uh, surveyed said that human error was their biggest concern. Mid-pandemic, this issue's only grown. Um, accidental and improper sharing of data by employees has grown to become probably one of the most critical threats facing uh, or concerning security leaders. And then finally, uh, the last five years and even up to today, we see uh, a growing concern with the introduction of things like GDPR, uh, privacy protection laws, CCPA in California, more close to home, Bill, uh, Bill 64 in Quebec, and, and other such privacy regimes. 
uh, where the penalties imposed on organizations and the costs incurred are much, much higher, and it's now a regulated uh, issue. It's, it's no longer uh, should we care about security, it's uh, you better care about security or it's going to cost a lot of money uh, to the organization, and in some cases even criminal liability. So let's back up a little bit. Let's talk about what is DNS. I'm not going to read the slide. I'm not going to take you through how DNS works. You can do that research on your own. But essentially, DNS is a, a system that is designed to point users to IP addresses and, and, and software applications to IP addresses because humans have a hard time remembering IP addresses. Names are a lot easier to remember. DNS has a, a long history, started all the way back with ARPANET in 1972, the concept of a, of a host or an ARPANET host name was, was introduced, and then Dr. Paul Mock Petras, pioneer of DNS, uh, publishes RFCs 882, 883, with some evolutions by 1986 into RFC 973. And finally, you know, uh, the ISC has founded DNS systems that we still use today, like BIND are introduced. By 1987, with RFC 1034, 1035, we basically have the DNS that we still have today. Uh, it's a 30-year-old technology that hasn't really evolved in 30 years, uh, long before a time when people were thinking about cybersecurity and what are the security implications of the way DNS works. Uh, for those of you who study internet history, you'll know that the internet was not designed to be secure, it was designed to be robust. So a decentralized naming system was designed to stop a bomb from destroying our infrastructure, and it was to route packets and be resilient, uh, but not necessarily concerned about data security or privacy. So important considerations for put, putting on the black hat for a second, the important consideration is DNS not built with security in mind. We didn't talk about it, but you probably all know that it's very trivial to register a domain name. Uh, you can do it anonymously, go buy a prepaid credit card at Shell, uh, throw it into your, your registrar of choice and, and register a domain name. It's very inexpensive. And finally, humans often make mistakes, and the, the component that DNS relies on is human input, more than anything. It's built for humans. So those are the things we want to keep in mind. Step aside for a sec and look at email. Let's look at email. You know, again, first thing we'll, we'll notice as, as we look at the diagram is that the very first step in composing an email is choosing a recipient. And how do you, how do you designate a recipient? You put in a name, add a domain. And right away, email is dependent on the domain name system. And if we take, for, forgetting the details of email, if we take uh, th this concept that DNS is inherently insecure, if email is dependent on it, well, then email is also insecure. Um, history of email, very similar timeline. I'm not going to go through it completely, but roughly the same timeline. We're looking at email that by and large hasn't changed. And I know some of you are probably thinking, oh, well, what about DNSSEC? And what about encryption? And what about all of these other protocol extensions that have come to pass since then? Well, you know, let, let's do an exercise. Show of hands, who sent an encrypted email in the last month? OK, I see about 5% of the room has done that. Now, show of hands, who sent a sensitive document by email in the last month? OK. So different people, different priorities. It's <laughs> maybe not the effect I was looking for there. But um, the point is that email is um, you know, basically unchanged since the last 30 years with, with some minor caveats. Important considerations. We know email is not built with security or privacy in mind, really. It's trivial to send or receive emails anonymously. It's actually quite easy to stand up and operate an inexpensive uh, email server or email infrastructure. And once again, humans make mistakes, and they make them quite often. Let's move into cyber squatting. So I'm sure you all know what cyber squatting is, but basically it's the practice of registering a domain name uh, with the intention of infringing upon the intended destination of the user. So uh, I could register SouthSec. That might be a form of domain squatting, uh, trying to leverage the trademark of NorthSec, just one shitty example. Um, many different types of cyber squatting. Uh, if you break them down into categories, we can look at typo squatting, which is quite common. So in this example, we have something like Gmail or Facebook with an extra O, simple typo mistake put in by the user. We have bit squatting, which is really interesting. Um, it's when you know, cosmic radiation from outer space comes and interferes with whatever is stored in your memory and flips a bit in the character. And all of a sudden, you typed in Microsoft, but you ended up with MikePosoft.com uh, in, in memory in the computer. 
and that's what gets processed by, in this case, DNS. Combo squatting, so taking a brand name, putting a dash in some other trust word or something like that. Uh, it's not owned by FedEx, but it's made to look like it is. Homograph squatting, which this is an interesting example. Uh, hotmail to a human looks exactly the same as hotmail to a human, but in this case, it's a different character. It's not the same character that's registered in DNS. Finally, PayPal. This one is a shout out to all the francophones out there. <laughs> uh, P-A-I-E-PAL.ca. Um, and then level squatting is another interesting technique that we see a lot, especially with mobile, given limited screen size. Uh, sometimes what happens is the domain name is truncated to the left-hand side and everything on the right-hand side is ignored, so uh, you know, the user's not actually paying attention to the real uh, domain or TLD. So, cyber squatting, not a mystery. We see it all the time. Uh, it's very common in phishing campaigns, uh, you know, as a way to bait people into clicking links that seem trustworthy. It's also a very common technique in spam and marketing. Um, one thing that's a, maybe a little less common, but, but still out there, is you know, watering hole attacks, man in the middle attacks. And finally, the thing I want to focus on today um, is intelligence collection and, and using this as a tool to, to gather information against a target. So let's get to the fun part. Time for the experiment. Um, I want to put a disclaimer out here. So uh, when I started this thing, I didn't know what I was going to find. I was kind of hoping like maybe somebody's going to send me an email and it'll be interesting. Uh, it turns out I actually collected an enormous amount of personal, private, sensitive information. Um, none of it's going to be shared. It's all going to be anonymized. I'm going to give you the meta-analysis. And um, everything that I've captured is basically analyzed and deleted on the spot. I'm not storing. I'm not interested in anybody's private data. But I am interested in, in, in showing what's possible with this kind of attack. So I had a few hypotheses going into this thing. My first one was that some small, but you know, given a large enough scale, not insignificant number of users, um, will mistype the domain name of a popular uh, or you know, a email address when, when they're typing in their recipient. I'm going to mistype the domain. We should be able to register some of those typo squatted variants. They shouldn't be that expensive. And uh, we, should, yeah, we should be able to do that easily. And then finally, the hypothesis is if I put a catch-all email address on the end of that typo squatted domain, I should start receiving emails intended for other people. But they're coming to me. So some of the key questions I had is, what kind of data can we capture this way? Is it possible to remain passive and anonymous in doing so? And can we employ similar techniques, um, or sorry, can we detect other actors employing similar techniques? Can we hypothesize who might be out there uh, doing a similar approach? And finally, how can we defend ourselves against such an attack? So you know, remember the email diagram from before. So this is a, a shitty edit I've made to it to sort of convey the idea. So, Alice means to send an email to bob at b.org, but he mistypes and he types in bob at c.org. Well, the email server has no problem with that. The email application accepts it, sends it for an NS lookup, and there's an MX record at c.org, and it says, yeah, sure, I'll take an email. Yeah, we've got a catch-all email address. I'm, I'm happy to receive an email for bob at c.org. And the email gets processed and delivered right into, um, in this case, the attacker or the, the malicious listener's email inbox. So just a, a little bit of info uh, to, to set you up for you know, how the experiment is set up. We have 12 different domain names that were registered. And I want to give a thank, uh, thanks, a shout out to a colleague of mine at Commissioners. I don't think he's here today, Simon, who uh, who'd also done some similar work here and, and was able to help me get this set up. We set them up on a shared webmail inbox with a catch-all email address on every single one of those domains, and we let it collect data for 45 days. Okay, so results. 123,000 emails. I was hoping to get like five, okay? Um, 2,700 emails per day is, you know, that's like one a minute or something ridiculous. You can watch them come in in real time. It's really interesting. Um, you might be wondering what kind of emails we received. Well, a lot of this. <laughs> There's a lot of spam, which was the first challenge that I came across was, how am I going to eat all of this? <laughs> you know, there's like a, a ton of spam to deal with. Um, it's ridiculous. So the vast majority of it is spam, frankly not unexpected uh, when, you, when you stop and think about it. Um, maybe, maybe for the next iteration of this talk, we'll talk about who the top spammers are. 
And there's, there's probably a lot of work uh, that could be done just around analyzing that. Um, but that wasn't the focus of the talk, so I didn't spend too much time on it. So emails of interest. Here's where things get really interesting. So I received, at last count, um, 204 Interact e-transfers um, with a total value of tens of thousands of dollars. Um, a lot of package tracking links and not the spam variant that you're all used to receiving. These were legitimate. Uh, personal banking notifications. So whether those are like... Um, you know, you, you spent money, some of you probably get those when you use your debit or credit card, you spent money here, you spent money there. Uh, there's a problem with your account, your account balance is running low. Those types of emails we collected and classified them as personal banking. Sales receipts, lots of sales receipts coming in. You know, I'm sure any one of you uh, shopping downtown, you've probably been asked if you want to receive an email uh, receipt. Well, maybe the girl mistyped your email and I got it. Um, Account verification, this one's dangerous. So a lot of account verification and activation links. Um, you know, this, this, we can talk a little bit more about the types of attacks we can pull off with this. Appointment confirmations, dental appointments, doctor's appointments, uh, sales meetings, all kinds of appointments. Personal resumes and employment applications. Think about the amount of data that's on your personal resumes. Um, sensitive data. There's, uh, you know, even over 45 days, this is almost... Uh, uh, yeah, almost one a day. Um, password reset links, loan applications and service contracts, uh, tenant notifications, uh, personal medical information, x-rays, uh, all kinds of information, you know, people's private health data, lease documents. Um, I got a completed security clearance application form, complete with passport, photo, and 10 years of personal history. Um, and finally, the most uh, impressive one I received was, uh, uh, I don't want to reveal too much, but it's one of the largest labor unions in the country. They were in the middle of a draft negotiation with the government, and I got an early version, an early look at the contract uh, before, before anybody else, basically, except for the lawyers. So some idea of what can be accomplished and collected in, again, just 45 days, just 12 domains. So let's talk about the exploit opportunities here. They're basically endless. Um, Identity theft comes to mind, extortion, social engineering. I can gather personal information that people may not be, you know, uh, aware is out and available to others. Doxing, I can do a account and credential theft, financial theft, um, impersonation. I didn't, I didn't claim any e-transfers. I don't know if that would work. <laughs> I'm not interested in trying. Um, impersonation, you know, once I know enough about a target, I can pretend to be them. And finally... I'm, I'm in the Army. I've personally seen people send things over a Gmail account. I've seen them send things over Hotmail accounts. Is there a national security threat here? Maybe. So how common is it? Um, I was curious to look around. I only registered 12 domains, but there's a lot of squatted variants of these things. So I looked at three examples. It's by, you know, not, not anywhere near exhaustive, but as some examples, if you look at gmail.com and you start looking at typo squatted variants, you'll find that there's 155 adjacent domains registered, and about 70 of them have active MX records on the domain. Outlook.com, similar stats. Yahoo, I guess it's been around longer, more highly targeted. Um, that's a lot of potential for theft right there, and we don't know who's behind these domains, and I can tell you when I looked at them, uh, many of them share the same IP address. Um, so one has to wonder who's listening, who's receiving those emails. Um, well, one, one thing that's interesting about this, and this is an example of um, what you can do against a public email service, but what about against an enterprise? You know, what, what, what about um, against a company domain or an enterprise domain? Can we do the same type of attack? And part of what inspired me on this talk was, uh, was one that I saw at the RSA conference um, where they use this as a red teaming technique, and, and one of the researchers said, hey, you know what, for 12 bucks, let's register the domain and just see what we get. And they got the keys to the kingdom. By, by like day six of the engagement, they, they received a, a mistyped password reset for their most sensitive database. They were able to change the password and log in with admin rights to, to the thing that the company most wanted to protect. If you want to see the talk, I highly recommend it. Um, I'll share the slides uh, afterwards, I guess, through NorthSec. I can probably do that. Um, this link will take you right to the interesting part of the talk. Um, okay, so how can we defend against this? The first thing I want to talk about, as I alluded to it earlier, is encryption. I wouldn't have really learned anything, or at least not anything meaningful, if these emails were encrypted. 
Um, they were all in clear text, and I could read them however I wanted. There was no SMIME certificates in use. I didn't, I didn't detect a single encrypted email in what I gathered. Uh, awareness training is a really big one. So I was digging for stats because I started asking myself, well, what about digital literacy? Do people understand that this is possible? Um, for me, it's shocking, but what about for other people? Um, StatsCan, the, the most recent most recent stats I could pull were from 2018 where they were looking at student digital, digital literacy ratings. Um, so in this case, 15-year-old students um, only, only like in Quebec, I think Canada-wide, 38% in Quebec were the, actually the lowest in the country. 30% of students reported being taught how to identify phishing or spam emails. You know, that, that's a pretty big problem. Um, I think awareness training across the board, maybe in, in school, all the way up into the enterprise, is really important. Um, and then finally, DNS solutions, I think, solve a lot of these problems. So monitor your DNS. Take a look at what requests are happening. Uh, there's DNS firewalls, DNS filtering out there. Uh, passive DNS is another interesting tool to detect things like newly registered domain names. There's a lot of research out there that shows if a domain name is new enough, it's probably malicious with a high degree of confidence. So don't resolve new domains. Um, there's a lot of tools for this, Farsight Security, Domain Tools. Um, there was uh, there's a few vendors here today, Flare Systems was there. They, they have a really neat platform that looks at a lot of this kind of thing. Uh, and then finally, um, if you talk to Dr. Paul Vixie, the guy who wrote Bind and maintains Bind for, for many, many years, or the father of the, the DNS, um, they'll tell you to run your own DNS resolver. Uh, it's really easy to set up. I know it's really easy to go and, and say, hey, you know what, get, get your domains from, or your, your IP addresses from 8.8.8.8, or, you know, what, what Cloudflare, wherever you want to resolve your DNS, but take control back. It's actually quite easy. Uh, you can throw it up on a Raspberry Pi, play with it. Uh, and you can use things that are called DNS response policy zones. So if you detect domains that are targeting um, your enterprise domain, you can set up a, a, a response policy zone that says, hey, if somebody asks for uh, gnail.com, well, send them to gmail.com. Give them the result for that instead. You can set that up, and you can do it uh, in response to the things that you're seeing on your network, maybe specific to your domain or the types of traffic that, that's happening on your network. Um, so DNS, big one. And then finally, some food for thought. Um, you know, the question is this brought up for me. It was, it was quite shocking. The first one was, is email an essential service or a critical infrastructure? You know, for the, the importance that it has in our lives, is it considered critical infrastructure? And if so, who's responsible for protecting it? Does this fall on the public email service providers? Does it fall on us as individuals or maybe uh, the root, root, uh, root, root authorities in, in the domain name system? Uh, the second question I had is, can I automate the analysis? You know, I started getting a little bit uncomfortable looking at some of this data and um, tried to remove myself from it as much as possible. So can we, can we do this kind of research in a more automated way um, that, that that generates meaningful threat intelligence, but also respects privacy. And finally, can we use similar approaches, exploiting typo squatting against other services? There's really interesting research done um, regarding NTP bit flips. Uh, some of you may have seen that research. The researcher that um, basically realized that every, I think it's every day, every 24 hours, a Windows machine checks in with time.microsoft.com. And he knew that bit flips were a thing and they were theorized, but he wanted to measure the rate that they happened at. And uh, he registered time dot, some bit flipped version of Microsoft.com. And he got millions of, of, of uh, NTP requests to his server um, in, in a very short amount of time. Uh, and then finally, uh, man in the middle, mon excuse me, monster in the middle. Uh, we'll make that a standard. Uh, or, you know, reverse proxying against web pages and popular web portals. You know, that, that could be another uh, abuse that's interesting to look at. Thank you.